1977. She is now retired from her analytic practice and from lecturing. If the feminine has been so rejected by the Christian myth, how has that affected women uh, psychologically? I mean... It has driven them into the animus. It has taken them their natural self-confidence and uh, driven them into, as a compensation, behave like men and get what we, in our jargon, call getting into the animus. Imitate men, behave in a brutal or rational or animacy way. Because uh, they have no self-assurance within their own femininity. Jung was very struck when he was in South India, which is matriarchal in its basic structure. There the men are rather miserable creatures with little white trousers like diapers around them and rather squashed. And, and the women are beautiful going around dig full of dignity in their saris. Mm -hmm. There it's a bit too much on the other side. And in every big family, the grandmother sits on top and rules the whole thing. But there the women are proud of themselves and bear themselves beautifully and look, look much better by that. Mm -hmm. Emanate self-confidence. And uh, with us you have to try to be as much as possible a man in order to be halfway recognized. It's hard to imagine what it would be like uh, when the animus uh, isn't ruling. I think the only thing to do is to get the animus out of the way and that the rest comes by itself. Because it's naturally not so much the outer men who really suppress the women, it's just as much the, the animus. And against outer men, if he, they want to suppress you, you can just walk out on them. But the animus is there for the real problem. To, to, one should found a women's liberation society against the animus, not against men. <laughs> that would be women's liberation. But and the then your femininity recovers by itself, mm -hmm. I mean. It, in a natural way. In a natural way. Mm -hmm. After all, one is a female. That's where cr the creative work of a woman comes in, isn't it? When, I mean, the animus, the only way to get him out of the way is to... Uh, well, you see, the animus has to be... The, is also in the creativity. And there is in his right place. That's why Jung was very much for women doing creative work, because that occupies the animus in what he should do, mm. namely relate to the unconscious. And then uh, also the animus is first, if somebody hasn't worked on the animus, the animus is undeveloped. And therefore, he's a, in, let's say, for instance, in scientific work, where I am mostly working, have more experience, the animus is a parrot. He repeats. He copies what, what is in other scientific books, he quotes, he accumulates quotations. Mm -hmm. And then one day you say to yourself, now, how do I understand that myself? Now let's put aside even Jung. Let's not quote Jung. Now let's say, how shall I put that um, myself out of my own experience? And then you notice sometimes you can't even form, articulate it. The, the animus is just quoting all the time. And you have then to, to really, uh, we have a beautiful German word uh, for uh, uh, creativity. It means schöpfen. And schöpfen means to take water up with a bucket out of a well. And that's uh, how it really feels to be creative. You have to say, now, how do I feel or think myself? And then you have to go deep, deep in a depression and go in a well and pull out the water from the depth. Where is the animus while you're doing this? He helps. <laughs> you see, then you, you dream about positive animus figures. When, I, uh, when I'm in the right way of working, I, I dream, for instance, a lot about very busy laborers working like mad. 
all in their blue Libra stress. Then I know, aha, now my energies are working on the right thing, working hard. So it's important for uh, somewhere for the woman's uh, consciousness to come in and yes. give a focus. The important thing is the, the woman's consciousness disidentifying with the animus because the, the terrible thing is that when one is in the animus, one doesn't feel one is in the animus first. One feels one is oneself. I have made Jung beautiful animus scenes and was absolutely honestly convinced it was my own holy conviction what I was expressing. Only a few hours later I thought, my God, why have I said all that nonsense? How could I? It isn't how I feel. But the, in the moment you are in the animus, you think it's you. So the first thing is to learn to notice. Now I'm in the animus. I notice it from my voice and such things. I suddenly think, ah. And it's a feeling in the body. I can't describe it. It's an endosomatic feeling. We feel now I'm in the animus. So when I stiffen my shoulders in a certain way, and I know now I'm in the animus. <laughs> <laughs> the bull, you know. <laughs> And then the first thing is to notice, ha, huh? I'm in the animus. Now careful, shut up. And then to disidentify and to think, what do I think? What do I feel? Separately from that entity. But one cannot, you see, the, generally one notices it in contact with men. I know I can even use quite primitive men if I have not a good contact with those laborers, for instance, out there. So then I know I'm in the animus. Because they know nothing about psychology, but they just won't take it. They get irritated. They don't know why, but I irritate them if I'm in the animus. So I try it out when I know I'm irritating men, which happens quite often. <laughs> <laughs> then I know, ah, damn it. <laughs> You spoke about playing with Jung uh, once by the lake. Did, did you do that from time to time? Yes. He liked to play. He, liked, he played a lot and he did it uh, very often alone. And uh, one of his favorite play was uh, along the lake, there is the shore like that and then going down and then the water comes and there is a, a gravel zone. And that is sometimes covered by water, but in spring and autumn it's free. And when it's free, then little springs come f out of that border, tiny little springs. And then he took always a little shovel and, and dug them up and r removed the sand and then played with little rivers and so on. And he said when he was 83, he said one day when we were playing, I, uh, I was generally sitting on my haunches beside him and watching him and playing a bit with him. And uh, he said to me, you know, only today I have suddenly thought, what am I doing when I'm playing like that? That's what I have done all my life, uh, digging out springs. Mm. But you see, he never reflect, he really didn't even reflect on what he was doing. He was just enjoying that. He called it the waterworks. And always before he was writing, he did some days or even weeks of waterworks till he was in the right mood, and then he began writing. And uh, somehow, for some pleasant reason for me, he allowed me to participate. So I sat sometimes for hours beside him, mm -hmm. just watching, not talking. Once an old peasant went along and said to me, Is thi isn't this Professor Jung not a world famous man? And I said, yes, he is. And he said, wouldn't think it if you see him like that. <laughs> Do you play now yourself? Yes. I play mostly with my toad pond. You see that, you have seen that pond outside. And there is a very rare type of toads in it, which you only find in the pre alp Austrian pre alps and Swiss pre alps nowhere else in the whole of Europe. And they are toads which do not croak, but make a, a beautiful bell sound, coo -coo 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 -coo, like that. And so I play mostly with those toads. Somehow that 
feels to me as if that would help me with the animus myself. Oh, yes. The play. Yes. The animus is always dramatic and serious. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was the anima. <laughs> uh, the ani well, the anima can be dramatic and serious, but she can also be uh, whining or humming bird, making humming bird noises. Or she has another melody. When you were in the States recently, um, you mentioned in a talk that one of the reasons you came over there was because you were puzzled about what was going on in the American psyche. Did it help to make that trip? Do you have any more impressions of what is going on? I, well, I, I have brought back my impressions. I don't know if they are mm -hmm. right or wrong, but uh, I have my impressions, and they are not very positive. That's why I would prefer not to talk about them. They are not very positive. No. I feel there is a terrific disorientation, a groping in the dark and uh, not knowing where to go, and, you know, grabbing every straw to hold on, experimenting, but No solid ground under the feet with most people. Is, is that a weather vane for the rest of the world? Well, America is a great, is a great amount of the world. If America goes wrong, goodbye to many other countries. Mm -hmm. So it depends on the American people very much to keep in balance, to my idea. What about the Jungian communities there that you As met? far as I contact them, you see, I was in Panarion and not in the clubs much. That's right. And as far as I contacted them, I, they, I thought they were very in very good shape. I had a good feeling about them. Mind you, the positive, uh, what uh, we European always feel very positive about America is the open-mindedness, the willing to experiment, the, uh, the not shying back from new ideas, uh, a certain, you know, straightforwardness. Uh, mm -hmm. That is the positive thing, which I experienced again as very positive and which is very stimulating to us who come from Europe where you tend to be rather a bit put under a lid, you know. But uh, I felt a terrific disorientation and a looking for a hero or a leader, and that, that is very, very dangerous. I wanted to ask if you can comment on um, whether or not there's a shadow. What is the shadow of? analytical psychology as it has developed since Jung? Well, the shadow of uh, Jungian <coughs> psychology I see mostly in the fact that Jung has found out everything he has found out through groping in the dark and tremendous suffering. And we are given that in our hands, what he has found out. And we are, so to speak, dispensing a medicine which we have not made. And therefore, people get inflated. They forget that they have not suffered. They have not found out those truths. They are merely using them. And because they are useful and you can cure people with them, then you get inflated. You think, oh, I am the great healer. I, I can cure uh, schizophrenia, which allegedly is not curable and so on. And you forget that it is not you are doing. It is Jung who found these things out. And Many Jungians forget, where am I? How far have I gotten with my own dreams, my own visions, my own shadow, and my own animus or anima? And there, 
the results look much more poor sometimes. And they forget that that is the important thing. So the danger is that there is again a, and then uh, that is especially an illness of men. They feel crushed by Jung and therefore they say, I must say different. For instance, they take a concept of Jung and they give it another name. But it means exactly the same thing, just to be original and creative and not just a Jungian or so on. And that all shows that they haven't understood that it is a reality with which one is confronted. And that it, one's task is to confront oneself with the same reality with which he has confronted himself. That's the same thing. And then if one does that oneself and if one stays loyal to one's own uh, work on oneself, one is constantly by one's own shadow dreams, etc., reminded that one is not Jung and hasn't gotten that far as he got. But the, the danger is inflation. You see it a bit, the same thing in, in St. Paul is always bordering inflation because he saw Christ and he deduces a bit that he, he wouldn't say he is Christ, but you know, he has the great word now to tell. It's a very different fate than Jung had. I mean, to, to come after him. To come after Jung is a very different fate and one has to fully realize and have the humility to also recognize this is an exceptional man. How, in my idea, he is of the size of Lao Tse or somebody like that. Very rare. That's a, a sort of man which is born every 2,000 years in history. And one cannot compare oneself with him. One has to try to learn from him what one can and know that there are enormous dimensions which we don't understand yet, which he understood. So one is really contained in him, in his work. I mean, it's in one way. Of in it. one way, one is contained in him, inevitably. But in another way, not. Because each time you realize it, something in yourself, in your own way, then it becomes yours. I, for instance, found out that when I read Jung, I can read his books 20 times, and I don't keep them in mind, by, so to speak, by heart. But when I do some creative work, research work, and then read his books, and it ties in in what I am doing in my own work, then it clicks, and then it stays forever. Then it's as if I had acquired it. I've really gotten the point, but only when I've creatively worked out my own approach. By, and that is really coming back to what I said before, getting out of the animus, who, who would simply quote Jung and say now, quite apart from qu the animus quoting Jung, what do I feel, what do I see, what have I experienced in my life, where am I, what can I say, not because Jung says it, but because I know it myself too, for my own reasons. And only that is valid. The rest can be just forgotten again. Or he, if people, uh, once uh, in the psychological club there was a big quarrel, we got all pulled into it, and Jung afterwards told us, I include myself, uh, told us, you all behaved as if you had never heard of Jungian psychology. You see, complex is hit and the whole thing's gone. Because it hasn't yet become really yours. It couldn't go if it had become yours. Is that how you see the splits that have happened in many of the training groups? Uh, partly that, and partly it's also that most of the pupils of Jung have only gotten one facet of Jung. The, Jung had so many facets that he also talked very diffi differently to the different people. He gave them what they could take or where they were open. He talked with one person about that and with another person about something quite different. For instance, I can say, he never talked to me because it never came up between us about parapsychology, or very rarely. Also very little about astrology, because uh, I have no leaning in that direction. Now, I hear from other Jungians the most amazing things he has told them about these things. I have just missed out on that, because I wasn't there when I worked with him. So you see, everybody got a facet. Mm -hmm. 
instead of realizing that Jung had so many facets and that the one, the Jung they understand isn't the whole Jung. It's their Jung. It's, it's the facet they, they got. So the, the splits are 80% are necessary. But the, uh, the great splits really come, as Jung once said about certain groups, they have given up Jungian psychology and they have taken to prestige psychology. And that's the end. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with what I mentioned before, the inflation. Thinking we are now the people who have the truth. And can make money and honor out and acquire honor through it. Did he feel that very few people really understood synchronicity? Yes. Mm -hmm. I have a devil of a time with it. I don't <laughs> really. It's hellishly difficult. Yeah. Terribly difficult. It's, it, it's so tricky because it's very easy seemingly. Mm -hmm. You have to only slip back into primitive magical thinking. You know all our conversation about be imps being in the machine mm -hmm. and so on. If you formulate it that way like primitives saying there are imps in the machine and and uh, now look here, the jet plane is just coming when I'm saying that and so on. The, you, you can just regress into magical thinking. And magical thinking is at the bottom of us all because it's the old way humanity always thought. But that's regression. The difficulty is to go forwards beyond causality mm -hmm. in the strict scientific work, beyond the modern concept of causality, which is probability and to really de define it severely and strictly in, without rejecting all what modern physics has found out and place it in there, that's the difficulty. To live with synchronicity, to joke about it, to, to watch it uh, is very easy. You, can only, you must only let the primitive man come up in you and he does it at once. He understands synchronicity like anything. All Chinese people or Japanese people, they understand synchronicity like that. And once Miyuki told me after a lecture I had, oh, th on synchronicity, oh, thank you for explaining synchronicity because for the first time I've understood causality. You know, I have always, when you spoke about causality in the West, I thought it was synchronicity. And now by you making the difference, I've seen that I've misunderstood it. And synchronicity to me is self-evident. I, that I understand self-evidently. The causality was what I missed out. I, and by you contrasting the two, you have for the first time taught me causality. <laughs> but that's the difficult thing. You see, Jung always thought, since he knew the I Ching, he, he meditated on synchronicity. But he said the difficulty of writing the paper on synchronicity is to make it palatable for modern physics mm -hmm. and for the modern sciences. What do you, in your book, you talk about two aspects, and I'm trying to understand it. A causal orderedness and creation in time. Yes. That is not, uh, I'm not talking about that. That's in the end of Jung's synchronicity paper. Mm -hmm. There he says, a causal orderedness is a just so order which has no cause. He, uh, that would be, for instance, uh, radioactive decay. You cannot say why it takes so and so much time for uranium to half into uh, lead. You can only say that's a just so story. It is so. It, uh, it's an exact law. It's a law of nature. We can go on it. We can even date things according to it. But why it is that and not another number, we don't know. That is a causal orderedness. Now that is not synchronicity. That's all, everywhere. A causal orderedness is, is a widespread appearance in nature. And the same in the mind. For instance, six is a number where you can add one, two, three, and you get six, or you can multiply one times two times three, and you get six. It's the only number where you can do that. Now. If you say why, you can't give a cause. You can only say it, it is obviously so. Our mind functions so. I mean, even the greatest idiot will have to admit it is so. 
because our mind is structured to, to believe it is so. But we can't give a cause. We, we can't explain it further. So there is a causal orderedness in the mind, in the, in the psyche, of which numbers are the natural numbers are beautiful examples, and there's e-causal orderedness in, in physics, and those would be all certain numerical laws. Or for instance, why is the light speed that much and not more or less? You can only say that light speed is that speed. Mm -hmm. You cannot say why. So that is a causal orderedness. Now, synchronicity would be the same thing, but a creation in time, that something new happens in time. Well, let's say, let's invent a synchronistic <coughs> event. Let's say I, uh, I am going to a shop and I choose a blue uh, frog and I have some changes made and they should send it next week. I lose in the meantime a ne near relative until, and when I, the box arrived, it's a black frog. Now, that's a synchronicity. It, it, it suits the theme of death and that I get by, m by mistake a black frog instead of a blue frog. That's a so-called synchronistic event. Something which is purely in my inside that I'm hit by the death of somebody also appears in the outer world in, in this era of getting a black frog. That the death hasn't caused the saleswoman to send me a black frog. There's no causal connection. It's just a synchronicity. That is, that has been created on the spot, so to speak, that event. That's not a regular event. You don't, ed every time you, you lose, uh, your relatives get black things sent to you by mistake. You see? That's a unique event, which will not repeat itself, very likely. So there, magical thinking would say a ghost made it, or God made it. Mm -hmm. And then it's very simple. Magic thinking explains it quite clearly. Mm -hmm. Fate did it. But if you don't think in magical causality, fate did it, God did it, uh, an imp did it, when you, when you really try, then you say it is an act of creation in time. Now, I think if you read that book of Fritjof Capra, The Tao of Physics, there he explains the S matrix, and there he gives, uh, there are four laws, the unchangeability of the uh, position of the observer, the quantum mechanical relativity, uh, causality, and the fourth, singularities. And singular by singularities, he means the uh, creation of new particles, which is unpredictable, completely unpredictable. That would be an analogy to the idea of synchronicity. Mm -hmm. And it also breaks through causality, because you can, with the laws of the calcul of probability, you can predi predict everything else, but you cannot predict the creative creation of a new particle. Mm -hmm. When and how it will happen, you cannot predict. Even not, you cannot even with improbability predict it. So that would be what the physicists call singularities, and synchronistic events are, in a way, like singularities. Is birth, uh, is birth of, a, of, a, of a creature, of a human being? Uh, you see, it's very difficult because most events are both. You can look at them from the causal standpoint, namely that a, a male and a female mated and, and, uh, and it was the right <laughs> day of the month and so on, and that's the cause of your birth. And there's a, a causal chain explaining why you came into this world. But you can also take it as a synchronicity. That's what astrology does, and say that a certain world moment, typical world moment, you sprang into existence as a singularity. And your singularity is expressed in the quality of that astrological moment. That would be the astrological or synchronistic explanation of birth. But what is so difficult is that most events you can simply look at from both angles. You can either explain them causally or other. You have both views. But Jung's difficulty in his paper was, therefore, 
to find cases where the causal explanation is excluded, where the causal explanation is out. And that is the best in telepathic future dreams. For instance, if somebody dreams ahead an earthquake, then you can say the dream has certainly not caused the earthquake, and the earthquake hasn't caused the dream because, uh, because at the time where the dream happened, the earthquake hadn't happened yet. That, there is a moment where it excludes causality. You cannot explain it causally. You can say one can explain it causally or synchronicity. Mm -hmm. That's why he, too, he, he had great trouble to find ex the few examples we have where it really exclude, they exclude each other, the two explanations to make his point. Mm -hmm. But uh, something like birth, you can simply look from both angles. Mm -hmm. You can explain it causally or synchronistically. Telepathic dreams are not that uncommon. I mean, well, they, they are very common, yes. Mm -hmm. And they always strike people as, as meaningful. Or mm -hmm. Even when they are seemingly meaningless, uh, this first case I was speaking just before, about. She had once a dream simply that uh, she heard certain numbers said. And the next day she opened the paper and an airplane of her country had crashed and on it had those numbers. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could not see the symbolic meaning of that. It, it was a synchronicity or a telepathic thing if you want, but I couldn't see any meaning in it. And Jung said that might have only just had the meaning to, to convince her of the reality of the psyche, and actually it did. Mm. From then on, she began to take her dreams more seriously. Before, she looked at me, you know, with a doubtful eye, kind of, you talk, but I don't believe it. <laughs> but that impressed her. So probably the unconscious just arranged that to show her, you know, I know everything. I, c I know even the number of an airplane crashing in uh, somewhere in another country. Uh -huh if I want to. That impressed her. It's, it's awesome to contemplate that everything about one's existence, one's personal life, for example, is known. The story is there. Yes, but uh, you must not interpret that in the, in the meaning of fatalism, you know, that it is absolutely predetermined. There is a kind of free space, free space of freedom in between. You, you, you have a certain choice on what level these things want to realize themselves. Uh, an astrologer has uh, explained that very well to me once. I asked uh, her, uh, can you pre how can you predict death from a horoscope? And she said, no, I cannot predict death, but I can assume if that person is old and ill and now has these and these and these negative constellations, quadrangular on Saturn and whatnot, you know, then it is likely that that person will not survive. But predict I can only, there will be a crisis. But if it's an outer crisis, a depression, an illness or death, I cannot say. And there I would say, not only one cannot say, but there's a certain freedom. Well, in, the, in such moments, the individual by its behavior can choose that it is a depression and not death, or an illness and not death. There's a certain margin of freedom. There were many times when Jung seemed close to death. I mean... Yes, and when he recovered, he always said, uh, they gave me another lease. <laughs> You've written about uh, Merlin and the relationship of this figure to, to Jung's own life. What about your own myth? Do you have a consciousness of your own, the, the, the archetypal pattern in your own life? I consider one big dream, I, the, the dream I mentioned before without mentioning what it was, but the dream I had between 
meeting Jung for the first time and then asking him to go in analysis with him, that be, which is a dream I consider the biggest dream in my life. That dream I consider con containing my myth. And it was, uh, it would take two tapes to tell it. It's a very, very, very long dream. But uh, the essence at the end of it is that I had to find the magical water which brings life and death. And then I, I, I experienced the birth of Aphrodite out of the sea. So I would say that is alchemy, that's, that's what I consider to be my myth. And the birth of a goddess. Yeah, that would be the birth. In a woman, that would be the birth of the self. The self in a feminine form. I would say if I fulfill the program of that dream, I'd be satisfied. But what do you meant by Merlin? Why did you mention Merlin? Well, I was, I was just um, impressed with the parallels in the... Well, that was life. like that, you see. Uh, when Jung asked me to finish the Grail book, Mrs. Jung had died, you know, and left it unfinished. She had left out the Merlin figure mm. because she assumed, like most literary researchers do, that this is a m cycle, a, a mythical figure of its own, and only artificially pulled into the Grail myth. And I took to Merlin at once and finally found out that he is really the secret of the Grail. He's the whole thing. He is the real secret. And so th that part, I in the end of the book, is all mine. And when I told Jung about Merlin, he was very impressed, and he said, oh my God, there are incredible parallels, many things you don't even know. When I built my tower, I first very much observed the stars from there. You know Merlin built his tower to observe the stars. Mm. And then there's this coincidence, Merlin, uh, a, a spring, a new spring came out of the earth, and in Jung they found a new spring near his tower, and, and all these parallels which I have mentioned. <laughs> and it was Jung who was so impressed. He said, <laughs> it's incredible. He said, I can't even tell you all the parallels. <laughs> but so that is Merlin. And you instinctively took to this figure, not as something that had been brought in as an artificial... No, no, I... I you see, through alchemy, I saw that he was the answer to all the unsolved problems. Because you see that the hero in the Grail legend is always a Christian, Parsifal, and so on. And, and, and trying there for, for perfection and falling and so on. And Merlin is the bringer together of the opposites. And he always sends secret messages to this erring Christian knight calling him to, to the goal, but uh, always misunderstood. M Merlin remains misunderstood right to the end of the story. But he is therefore, uh, there is even an alchemical writing who speaks about Merculinus, which is a mixture of Mercurius and Merlin. They, they knew that they, he was the same spirit as Mercurius, mm -hmm. only a Celtic mm -hmm. tradition, which then was melted with and there's a lot of the Jewish Elias figure. It's an archetype. It's the archetype of the, uh, of, uh, of the shaman, of the great shaman, prophet, medicine man. Did Jung feel that his work would uh, be not understood for a long time? He thought it was possible that it would disappear, that, for instance, through a war there would be an age of barbarian disintegration and that he would d disappear and that he might be, if our civilization survives, or somewhere mankind survives, perhaps in Australia or God knows where, he might be dug up again later. He said, I might have the fate of Meister Eckhart, who was forgotten for 400 years, and then dug up again, and suddenly one discovered he had been one of the greatest mystics German mystics of the Middle Ages, mm -hmm. late Middle Ages. And he thought that would 
It happened quite possibly with him too. There's a story that goes about that Jung thought he was the reincarnation of Meister Eckhart. I've never heard about that. Mm. These stories get woven. Well, you know, he says, uh, he says something like he feels very akin to him. Or he writes, uh, uh, one ought to read a bit more Meister Eckhart and so on. He writes in one of his papers mm -hmm. with an exclamation mark and so on. He's, he, he felt certainly that Meister Eckhart was a brother in the spirit. But uh, between concluding that that and the reincarnation, that is a bit going further. Mm -hmm then he, at least I never heard him say so. Did he ever talk about reincarnation with you? No, not with me especially. He once talked when we had a drive in the car, Miss Anna, Barbara and I, he talked a lot about it. What are your own views about it? I can't make up my mind. Mm. I'm very uncertain. You know, one has naturally, I have also had such experiences in, in reality and in dreams that I come somewhere and I feel I've always been there. Or I know this place and I've never been there. Mm. And that is terribly vivid. And, or you dream about places in your dreams often again after years, after 10 years, you have a, see again the same place. And you know it's a place you have never seen in reality. It's a landscape you have never seen in reality. Now how it does that image of that landscape be in you, and so vividly be in you when, when you have never seen such a thing, when it's not a, probably not a memory image of your present life. But the unconscious is such a, master trickster that we don't know how else it can produce such an image in you without the cause of reincarnation. I just don't know. I, I feel a bit like Wilhelm Busch. He says uh, the, the question of reincarnation is, uh, is, is a problem because how will I be able to say it's me <laughs> when I come again? What is so lacking is, I mean, if I were the Dalai Lama and could remember my reincarnation, that would be different, but I do not. The question of an identity, what is the identity that is built in the, in the, in the individuation process, or if you call it the subtle body, and what is that identity that, that goes on is involved also? It is involved. Now, you see, you have probably read that fashionable book, Life After Life for mm -hmm. Moody. And w w there you see that the idea is that uh, absolutely the ordinary identity, ego goes on, at least the first step towards the border, we don't know what happens when the people go up over that absolute borderline or if they dissolve later. And I can only say the dreams I have to, naturally at my age, I had to accompany several dying people in, in my life who were my analysands and went on with analysis right to their death. And uh, there are the dreams, I could tell you, infinite amount of dreams, which confirm this life after life stuff only in a much richer form, in a much more pictorial and richer form. That stuff is rather uh, repetitive and poor, mm. but, but it goes exactly in the same direction, that something, the identity survives, and that the, there's a feeling of I am I and me mm -hmm. going on. But then how long that lasts, if that lasts for a while, for instance, and then dissipates, as the Chinese think, that only very great people last over the centuries, the others after 50, 60 years fade, or if one dissolves in nirvana, or if one remains forever one's own identity and returns. I can only say I'll see. <laughs> There's something more to discover. <laughs>